Thanks, man. Good morning, church. It's nice to see you all. I have not been here uh, on and off throughout the summer. Um, so I need to ask you guys for some prayer. If I'm not here on a Sunday, unless I'm sick, which is not very often, uh, it normally means that I am playing softball. Uh, my team is really good this year, and we just keep playing into Sunday. But the cool thing about that is that in the world of softball, I'm amongst a bunch of people who don't believe in Jesus, who are asking a lot of questions. And when I'm there on a Sunday, I'm having an impact around a bunch of folks who wouldn't be here. And so I just ask you, if you notice I'm not here, know that I'm in the middle of my mission field. And those folks are asking questions about Jesus that I wouldn't get to answer here ever. So it's an awesome opportunity. Um, you know, I suspect that at times we're going to see some of those folks roll in, and I hope that you guys are as welcoming as I told them you would be when they get here. Um, and I know you will be. I don't even have a question about that. So anyway, if you don't notice me here, pray for me because it means that something's happening. And really, I want to win, too. So there's kind of a double purpose uh, for real. Um, so anyway, thank you for coming today. So we have a bunch of folks back from vacation. Uh, one of the people who is back from vacation but who is not here is Pastor Mark. Um, Sounds like, Annette, and you can correct me, but Summer is not feeling well, and Mark was up all night helping her. So if you could pray for Summer today, too. She's had, you know, a history of some, some medical issues in particular, uh, one real bad one. So just pray for that. It's not, a, it's not a normal thing, but Annette needs peace, I'm sure, <laughs> remembering the past. So pray for Summer that uh, she just gets feeling better today, and, and uh, they'll be back next week. So couple things before we jump into this. Um, <clears throat> when I come to preach to you, there's a couple things that I, I have to work through most of the time. I think it's a privilege to have a microphone, um, but it's also a big responsibility to have a microphone. Um, and I take very seriously what I say. I take it seriously because oftentimes uh, the way my mind works is that I'm working through something in scripture or that I've been brought up with that I need to challenge and find out, am I still in the same place? Do I really believe God said this? Did he not say this? What does that mean? And how does that play out today? And so I take really seriously what I bring to you because I do not want to mislead anybody ever. Like my intent is never to come up here and mislead you down a path that is not godly. Um, but because my mind works in ways that can scare traditional Christians at times, um, it can feel scary. And so I am always walking this tightrope tight because I'm willing to ask questions that maybe other people don't like to ask, ask sometimes. But I also don't want to mislead anyone. And so I just want you to know that I prayerfully consider what I talk about. Um, and that is always uh, in my mind. Secondly, this sermon is really speaking to a bigger issue. And if we were doing more than a 20-minute takeaway, probably it would be one sermon. But we're not. And so I'm going to try to take you somewhere today. But I want you to focus not just on the details of what I might be saying. I want you also to focus on the heart of what I'm saying. Because that's really the key. And it's going to lead into a discussion next week about church and, and what it is. And why are we doing it. But we can't get there without discussing some of the things we need to discuss today that will lay down just the heart of where I think we maybe are missing the mark in other areas. Does that make sense? So stick with me through this. Uh, and thirdly, I suspect we're going to have a real lively discussion time afterwards. <laughs> so you might want to stick around. Um, I hope that afterwards you guys like me. But the truth of the matter is this. I kind of don't care. Like, I want to care because I like all of you, but I feel like my role that I have put to the side so often is to stand for people who can't stand for themselves. And oftentimes, I will put uh, my desire to be liked above that role. And it's probably time that I stop that. It's not what I'm gifted in. And so today, I'm going to present some stuff that's going to feel a little scary. And I want to talk about it. It's an open dialogue. But um, I can't just keep catering to people's ears and tickling them. That's not good for anybody. So with all that, let's get rolling. So my first heading title is, is Ray and the Gays. I got a buddy named Ray. And I go golfing every year with Ray and, and a bunch of my other buddies at a 
from Chapel Point. We're a very conservative church. You all have talked to me numerous times, or I've talked to you numerous times about how I grew up. And um, Ray, is, Ray is a good guy. He believes the Bible. He believes in Jesus. And this is probably four years ago, and it's right as uh, gay marriage has become legalized. And if you know any of my story, I started as an extreme homophobe, extreme. Uh, I think I said at one point, put them all in Alcatraz. Take care of it that way. So I was fairly extreme. Uh, to a person who started questioning some things about, but is that loving? What would Jesus do? All this, right? So it's been a journey for me. This whole thing has been a journey. So we get to gay marriage being legalized. And the thing that I was working through was, what does the church do about this? Because if we, because the truth is this. 10 to 15 years after this becomes legal, this becomes a complete norm in society. The church has to figure out what it's going to do about that. Whether you think it's sin or not sin, you're going to have to work through what do you do. Because the deadline is coming, right? So these are the things I'm thinking through. What does the church do? Because it has to do something. Because culture changed rapidly. So Ray's discussion was simply a frustration with the fact that America had let this uh, law pass. He did not feel like that was something that... Um, was godly. He was frustrated about it. And in the middle of a very conservative Christian group, generally speaking, I'm the one who may have a question about things. Um, and I think you probably are not shocked about that. And I didn't say a whole lot. I just listened, except for to say, what I'm concerned about is like, what do we do with it? Because frankly, that water's under the bridge. Like, it's not coming back. It's just like abortion. It's not going to go away. Like, this is done. So now what to do with it is the question, not how do we get the water back under the bridge. That's not even the discussion anymore. So that's what I said to Ray. And Ray said, so what do you do, though? Are you going to marry a gay couple? And I paused because, frankly, I didn't know the answer. I probably would have said no, but I didn't know. And I said, well, let me ask you a question, Ray. So would you be okay if I married a divorced couple? or somebody who had already been married before. Is that okay? Because if we're just talking about what the Bible says, in black and white, I can go find words that talk about this being wrong. Like I can find a, a passage that says, plain as day, that if I do marry a divorced couple, I'm like complicit in making someone commit adultery until they die, right? I'm a piece of that, I said it was okay. And I am putting them in a spot where they are stuck in sin, no matter what I do. It doesn't make any difference. And I said, so you're, you're asking me if I'll marry a gay couple, but you'd never ask me if, if, if I'd marry a divorced couple, ever. And yet in the Bible, it says very clearly, I, I shouldn't probably do that. So why do you have a problem if I said yes to this one? Now, granted, you may make an argument out of silence, and not complete silence, about marrying a gay couple, right? You can make an argument that you shouldn't do that. Ray's response was, well, listen, just because it doesn't discuss it doesn't mean it's not obvious. You shouldn't do that. And I, of course, told him you can't make an argument from silence. It doesn't talk about it. You can assume some things. I get that. But you can't, you can't just decide something. And why do you not care about the one that's in black and white was more of my question. It, it set me down two paths. One path, what would I do? How do I handle this? Uh, two path, second path, some people say. <laughs> or path B, or path, and there's so many other ways I could have said that, and two path was not the one. That was the, the other one. That's, you should never even say that. <laughs> so second path was, so why is it OK, though? that some sins were affirmative about. Because with divorce, I would say, and I think, if I, even if I ask for a raise of hands, which maybe I will, I think I'm divorce, marriage, remarriage affirmative. I, are most of you with me on that? And I thought about the other sins that are in the Bible in black and white that are very clear. And Mark is your pastor. Now, I don't have tattoos, so I'm just a little higher on the holy scale than Mark. <laughs> a little bit. But he does. The Bible prohibits that. 
But you go to Leviticus, it is clear. And I think even Paul alludes to it. So we can say Old Testament, New Testament on this one. So even with tattoos, the Bible never said it was okay. Now, you might argue there's different reasons and all that, and that's cool. But if we're just talking about the words and what it says, those are wrong. But I'm tattoo affirmative, absolutely affirmative. I support those who have them, and my wife has them, so I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> Even though that's what I should do, I'm not going to do it. But it's not just that. Like, I have never been in a church. I know one that existed, but I've never been in one where women have to wear head coverings. But there's nothing that says in the Bible that that stopped. It doesn't say it stopped. So I'm, I don't even know how to say this one, a non-head covering for women affirmative? <laughs> I shave, and I know I don't have a whole lot of hair cut. God took care of that one. But I still cut it. The Bible says two things about that. One, it's shameful for men to have long hair, which I don't know what you do because the Old Testament says we're not supposed to be cutting our hair. So I'm not entirely sure how you work that one out. But in either case, I'm in trouble on that one, right? Because I cut my hair and I don't cut my hair. Either way, I'm affirmative about hair stuff. <laughs> and all of these things are listed. And then they have other simple ones like charging interest. So interest was punishable by death in the Old Testament. So if you're working for a bank or any other financial institution who has charged interest, that's something God's not cool with. So what do we do? I guess I'm interest affirmative because I don't care. I don't care that that's a sin. I don't care about uh, the couples in there who decide certain times of month they may want to have a nice time. The Bible cares about that, right? Because it says there's certain times we shouldn't be doing things. Certain times you could be doing things. I'm, I don't even, I'm not even going to try to guess what affirmative I am there, but it's something. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like there was a joke about Sunday, bloody, bloody Sunday in there, and I thought, we're just going to leave that one aside. <laughs> we're not going to say that. <laughs> Which notice, uh, anyway. So you see what I'm saying, right? My problem is, is that the Christians I know, the people I know and myself are affirmative to all these things that I cannot say disappeared in Scripture. We're affirmative. We support behaviors that Jesus, that the Bible, that God would have said are sin, and we not only support them, we enthusiastically support them and don't see an issue with it. So it leads me down this path because I don't know what to do. Because Ray's question is tough for me. So I went down two thoughts there. One was, well, am I wrong in thinking that I would marry a divorced couple? Am I putting them in a spot where I've trapped them? And, and am I reading this whole thing wrong? And I need to be more harsh about my decision making in regards to what scripture says. Because I don't want to lead anybody into trouble. I'm not trying to put you in a spot where you're in a damned spot about adultery the rest of your life. That's not what I'm shooting for. So have I just read this wrong and I need to be even more strict about the way I'm reading scripture? Should I have a problem with tattoos? Should I have a problem with these other things? Because I joke about it, but I do wonder about these things, right? These are the things I'm thinking about. Or, on the contrary, why do we choose some things that are affirmative and other things that are not affirmative? And this has been a journey. It's been a long journey trying to work through what do I think about these things. Anything I say here today is Nick's, Nick's thought. This is not a new vintage approved discussion. This is just things you're hearing from me. So I want you to hear that. So I don't know what to do. Because Paul says that we're not under the law anymore. That the law, all these things that I just brought up are not part of our, our, we're under a new covenant, right? So that law is dead. And if you want to obey the law, though, you can. That's your choice. But if you're going to obey a little bit of it, you've got to obey everything about it, not just some of the things, right? It's, it's very clear in Galatians that Paul is saying, if you want to go ahead and live in slavery again and live under the law, you can do that. But 
you should just accept the grace that Jesus is providing. And it's in a discussion in regards to circumcision. Paul even says, if you really want to do that, go all the way and just emasculate yourself. So Paul was passionate about this discussion. Don't go back to become slaves to the law when Jesus gave you freedom. And so what does Jesus say? When we look at Jesus, what Jesus says is, I give you a new command. Love each, love each other just like I loved you. And trying to find the answer to these questions, I think about a whole community of people, the LGBTQ community. And I don't know what to do with how they hear our message. I don't know what to do with them. Because our message is that all these other sins are okay. And that law doesn't count if we believe what Paul said. So they don't matter. And yet, that one does matter. And what do I mean by that? So, if we're going to church and Mark had tattoos and we believe that we have to just stick with the law, Mark shouldn't be preaching. Right? Because if he has tattoos, we don't have restrictions on what he does. Right? He could still serve with kids. He could do other things. If you come in here and you are somebody who uh, is a glutton like myself, no one makes restrictions on what I do. Like I can still serve in every other area of the church because I'm completely welcome because you affirm me as someone, even though my behavior is contrary to what scripture might say. Right? There's no restrictions for me. But in general, if you came in and your, your issue is that you live in the L LGBTQ community, there's a restriction for you. So not only can you not just come in and just serve anywhere, like there's probably a policy written somewhere about what you can and can't do. And I don't get it. Because I feel like if we're going to say that <clears throat> some of those sins in the law are no longer applicable and say it's okay just because culture said it's okay. We have, to, we, have, we have two choices. Either they're all not applicable, and we really have to believe what Jesus said, love your neighbors yourself, and love people like I loved you, or we have to say they're all applicable, and we need to start getting a lot harsher about every single sin. Not just some of them, not just our favorite ones. Like, we have to be harsh about all of them. That is your option. And I think that's what Paul's saying, right? Paul is saying you can choose to live under the law if that's what you think you want to do. But if you're going to do one, do them all. And I think when the, the, the community, the LGBTQ community hears us, what they hear is what Paul is saying. They see this. They see this divide. They see that we only care about certain sins. And we don't care about all of them. But their sin is worse than the rest of them. And so we have a church who believes in Jesus, who wants people to come to Christ, who knows that the hope of the world has to be found through Christ. We have that message, and what we do is we make that door so difficult to walk through for that community that they don't ever come, and they find their answers somewhere else. And I don't know what to do with it. Because I don't think it's right. So I'm gay affirming. It's been a long time for me to get to that point. I've had to think through why. That door is important. It is important that people hear about who Jesus is. Everything we do that blocks that door from people hearing that message sends more people to hell. I'm not cool with that. I'm not going to stand here and be okay with that anymore. I'm not telling you that the church policy is that we're going to put flags up. I'm just saying for me, this is where I have to land. I want you to join me in that. Because I don't want the next person who walks in here who lives in that community to wonder, so I love these people, but would they come to my wedding? I don't want the next person to walk in here who is gifted, who knows who Jesus is at their core and has the ability to be a leader, to wonder, but could I be a leader here? Is my sin going to be the one that's so big that I can't be a leader here? I don't want these people to question 
if they're not just one of us, the big messy bunch that we are, but their sin is somehow bigger than ours. Because it's not fair, and it's not right. So I guess my challenge about this piece is that I want to ask you, what do you want to live under? Because if you want to live under the law, then I expect that we are going to start questioning the couples who come here who we know aren't married, who are coming with, with each other in the morning. I expect you to start wondering, when they come to me and say, I want to serve in nursery, then I'm going to have to start telling them no, right? I'm going to have to start saying no to everybody. I don't think it's fair not to. I don't think it's reasonable. I don't think it's just. I don't think it's godly for me to say no to this one community and say yes to everybody else. The fact that I even have to talk about this is what frustrates me. And I think that leads us to our discussion next week. I'm not sure. What time am I supposed to be done right now? <laughs> I should have set a timer for 22 minutes. How are we, how are we doing? You're at I'm at 21. That's great. Okay. Okay, so the, dis so the piece that I want you to think through going into next week is, so what is the church for then? What are we here for? The church in America is dying rapidly. The church in the world is dying rapidly. I don't think it's because we come too lenient on sin. I think it's because we're discussing things that we shouldn't be discussing. I am not here to tell you that sin is not important. Sin is extremely important, but it's important as secondary to Christ. It is secondary to the hope that Jesus brings us. And I think what we've done is flip spots. And I want to discuss next week, how do we bring the supremacy of Christ and the hope that he provides back to the church? Because I don't think we're going to exist much longer if we don't do it. Anyway, thank you guys for listening. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we will break into our discussion group, and I suppose it'll be lively. Jesus, I thank you for, man, I thank you for you. I thank you for taking me on journeys that I don't want to go on. Um, oh, and I don't thank you for making me think the way I do, because it's not easy. Lord, I just ask you to give everybody wisdom, give everybody compassion, and the ability to imagine what it's like to live in somebody else's shoes. Help us to honor you with what we do and the decisions we make. And Lord, teach us how to bring the church back to the discussion of what you've done for us, who you are, and the abundance that we can find inside of that life. Man, the church is supposed to be the hope, Lord. Help us to know how to be the hope of the world, showing people the hope that you are. Help us to really believe that the gospel is good, good, good news. So much better than we could ever imagine. Oh, Lord, thank you for this day. Man, thank you for trees that fall in your yard. Um, and thank you for, for these people here, Lord. Uh, and thanks for this opportunity. In your name I pray, man.